more examples about uh, valve hemodynamics through this lecture about a variety of valvular diseases. Uh, so a lot of tracings. Um, here, let me. So I will start with this. Um, so this is a tracing of LV and aortic pressure, okay? Uh, always when you look at tracing, analyze systole and diastole, don't omit any phase. The common tracing you will see in valvular diseases, uh, the common simultaneous tracings are LV aorta for assessment of aortic or LVOT disease, uh, or the other type of tracing is LA pressure and LV for assessment of mitral valve disease and always analyze systole and diastole in each type of tracings. In this patient, uh, what you see here compared to here, in systole, there is no aortic stenosis. It looks fine. The problem is in diastole. The aortic diastolic pressure almost approximate the LV EDP. Whenever you see that, compare it to this, this is very, very suggestive of severe and decompensated AI, aortic insufficiency. And when this approximation, we call it uh, bad when, or significant, when it's the difference is less than 30 millimeter of mercury, or in relative term, that difference is less than 25% of the systolic pressure. So here it's 20 millimeter of mercury, it's less than 25% of the systolic pressure. So uh, this is what we call significant approximation of aortic diastolic pressure or, and the LV EDP, or we call it all, also almost diastasis when they touch each other fully. Uh, compare it to this one where there is no, no uh, significant approximation at all. So this is suggestive of AI, this tracing, severe AI, decompensated severe AI, where the aortic diastolic pressure drops and the LV compliance is overwhelmed so much so that the LVDP rises. Now I think in this suggestive of AI compared to this, I want you to all notice the loss of dicrotic notch or attenuation of dicrotic notch on a properly damped uh, tracing. Of course, if you have a damped, overly damped tracing, that doesn't mean much, but on a properly dam damped tracing, this is suggestive of AI. Another thing is you can see wide pulse pressure. And I just want to uh, tell you what we call wide pulse pressure is over half systolic pressure. So the pulse pressure is more than half the systolic pressure. Those are the three most common feature of severe AI. Approximation of LV aorta and endiastole, wide pulse pressure, and attenuation of the dicrotic notch. This is kind of uh, from Jack in an explanation of that. Uh, so this is another example of the three situations you encounter in AI, in acute and Chronic decompensated AI is when you get that massive approximation of aorta and LV, so much so that the shape in this area becomes like a triangle. It's a dangerous triangle that you see here, aorta, LV, they touch each other, which is what we call diastasis. Now, um, another thing that you notice on all those tracing, again, especially the acute AI, is that you have attenuation of dicrotic notch. Sometimes it's a little preserved in chronic AI where the aorta regains its, its compliance, but you don't have it usually in acute AI. Uh, another feature here is chronic AI. So when you're chronic compensated AI, the LV is not overwhelmed. The LV adjusts its compliance and dilates. So the LVDP doesn't rise. That's why you don't have diastasis. Another thing in chronic AI is you get LV dilatation, and you get a big uh, forward, a big um, total stroke volume, so much so that you get a very wide pulse pressure. And actually, wide pulse pressure, uh, as well as all the wide pulse pressure signs on physical exam, are all seen in chronic AI, not in acute AI. In acute AI, you can get. Um, somewhat wide pulse pressure, but the systolic pressure is not high and that pulse pressure is not dramatically wide. 
this is when you get wide pulse pressure and bounding pulses in chronic AI. Um, all right. Um, I'm going to give you, um, and it, actually, by the way, on this slide, also, I want to highlight that this area between the aortic pressure in diastole and LV, this is actually what is traced as pressure halftime on echo Doppler. Okay, it's the difference between the aorta and the LV difference. Uh, it's the velocity, which is dependent on the difference in pressure between aorta and LV. So the shape of the pressure half time is exactly the shape of that difference in pressure. So in chronic compensated AI, there is a gradual drop in velocity and slow pressure half time that may even exceed 250 uh, milliseconds. Whereas in acute and decompensated AI, it's a steep pressure half time. So pressure half time correlates with how compensated AI more than it correlates with the severity of AI. This is another case to illustrate those concepts. Um, I will go over those myself uh, to illustrate the points. Um, so this is a case, I want you to look here. So again, aortic LV pressure analyzed systole, systematically, and diastole. So in systole, it seems there is a degree of aortic stenosis. There is a gradient, uh, maybe peak to peak gradient around 30 millimeter of mercury between this and this. Uh, there is an interesting shape. It is a shape that's consistent with aortic stenosis. Remember from our prior talk, it's a late peaking aortic pressure with an anacrotic notch, low lying anacrotic notch on the aortic upstroke. So we see that anacrotic notch. When you, when you hit the limiting surface, uh, the, the limiting opening of the aortic valve, the pressure bends and peaks late. And this is what we call the anacrotic notch. So you wonder here is that AS is more severe than what the gradient suggests. It's possible, maybe we have an error in calibration or maybe we have what we call that common scenario of low gradient severe AS with even with normally F. So that's a possibility. So don't ignore that tracing. It is kind of worrisome. But don't stop here, look in diastole as well. And when you look in diastole, you will see well, it's interesting. You have, look at that area and on some of the beat it's more pronounced. And you can see the LVDP is somewhere around here, around 30 millimeter of mercury uh, or 35 or so, while the aortic diastolic pressure is about 60. So there is approximation about 30 millimeter of mercury, uh, you know, at the borderline, um, in the borderline zone of significance. But that's worrisome. Also, you notice this is a very well damped tracing. You see a very good anacrotic notch, yet you barely see a dichrotic notch. And that's also worrisome for severe AI. Uh, also, the pulse pressure is not wide, but it's wider than you would expect in aortic stenosis, where you get um, what we call that pulses parvus, meaning a narrow pulse pressure. So all those features, the dichrotic notch attenuation, the widening of the pulse pressure, and the kind of approximation in end diastole between LV and aorta are suggestive. Maybe this patient has severe AI on top of some degree of aortic stenosis. So in this particular patient, we did something else and that proved the point. We looked for the fourth feature of aortic insufficiency, which is this. We pulled the catheter, that was a transradial case. So we pulled the catheter from the aorta to the subclavian, brachial, and radial artery. And you can see here a feature, uh, you know, very suggestive of aortic insufficiency, which is the dramatic systolic pressure amplification in the periphery, okay? You go from 120 millimeter of mercury systolic pressure in the aorta to uh, over 200 millimeter of mercury in the radial artery. 
so 180 in the brachial artery. So whenever you have a rise of over six, over 40, but especially over 60 millimeter of mercury in the periphery, this is very suggestive of severe AI, okay? Um, so in retrospect, that's, this is what this patient had. He had probably severe AI. Uh, let me see. Uh, I want to try to move, okay. This is what he has. So we had severe AI and some degree of aortic stenosis. Now, what is the degree of aortic stenosis? Can somebody guess how severe is the aortic stenosis? And how does the AI interact with the aortic stenosis? Is the aortic stenosis severe or not? If you have to guess. I guess no. Yes. Why do you think so? Uh, I think this gradient might be due to increased flow and the uh, anacrotic notch is preserved. Yes. Well, uh, I mean, anacrotic notch could suggest severe aortic stenosis. So maybe anacrotic notch doesn't help me much here. It doesn't help me that the, that the aortic stenosis is hemodynamically significant. It doesn't tell me that it's anatomically significant. It doesn't tell me in this particular case that the valve area is less than one. Your what about the peak, peak to peak gradient? I mean, it's not that high to. That, exactly. Consider. Yeah, but like I said, you could have, especially in the current era, we do see a lot of low gradient severe aortic stenosis, where the gradient is about 30, but the valve area is 0.9. So it could have been, but it isn't. It's because uh, what Ahmed said, it's really the AI exaggerating that gradient and exaggerating the hemodynamic significance of AS. This is the equation that explains it. It's the Gorlin equation. So I always go back to that equation. Valve area equal valve flow divided by square root of pressure gradient. So if you flip it around, the pressure gradient for the same valve area, the pressure gradient is depending on the square of the flow. So when you have severe aortic insufficiency, you have very high flow more than double the flow crossing that aortic valve. When you double the flow, you can quadruple the pressure gradient. And that same valve area becomes, even though 1.5 centimeters square is, a, is you know, mild AS, but it may be stenotic functionally because you have double blood flow crossing that valve. And that's exactly what you have. And that's why you get an exaggeration in gradient and you get an exaggeration of a shape suggestive of AS, which is the, the anacrotic notch, because that AS is functionally obstructive without being anatomically obstructive. So this patient has mixed severe AI, but also probably mild AS. I think the gradient, you probably have to divide it at least in half. So really the gradient is probably very mild, but it's very much exaggerated by the massive aortic insufficiency, okay? And that's why you have the anacrotic notch. The valve area becomes anatomically, becomes functionally obstructive of that big flow at some point. Another thing I want to highlight in that tracing. So in AI, you get that peripheral systolic amplification. That's due to that big initial stroke volume you get in the aorta, which gets which leads to a dramatic rise in pressure in the peripheral artery more than the aorta, simply because the peripheral artery are much less compliant than the aorta. They are more muscular and less elastic and much more compliant and much less compliant, which leads to the striking rise in pressure. That's one explanation. Another thing you notice on this particular tracing, I want you to try to think, where is the dichrotic notch here? And, you know, look, is this the dichrotic notch or is this the dichrotic notch? Can anybody tell me which one is the dichrotic notch here or is this or is that? I think it's the second one. And the first one may be the, the Biffet Bulse or the Bulse Spesferians for the AI. Yes, excellent. You know everything, good. So uh, look, so yes, exactly. So this is characteristic of aortic insufficiency. 
you don't just, this is normally how you have an aortic pressure, the black one, and this is a peripheral uh, pressure, let's say brachial or radial. You do get some amplification of pressure and you do get elongation of pressure and a more pronounced diacrotic notch in the periphery. But all this is very much exaggerated in AI with a bisphariance pulse. So in AI, you get systolic amplification, which is what you call the percussion wave of that big initial stroke volume. But you also get a pronounced, what you call tidal wave of very pronounced, uh, what we call um, a reflected wave in the periphery. From that initial earthquake, you, you get small uh, shakes afterwards that create that, um, you know, again, what we call reflected waves and reflected pressure. So you get that second pressure and spre uh, second peak, and this is what we call the pulses bisphariance. Then you have finally the dichrotic notch. But again, remember bisphariance pulse in AI. Um, all right, so I hope everybody got that aortic insufficiency features. Want to move on to another tracing that I like, which is uh, also very interesting. I want you to look at that. Start with the left-handed uh, pressure tracing. So this is LV and this is a brachial artery as a surrogate of aortic pressure. Like we just showed, it's not a good surrogate, but it's a surrogate when you're analyzing for aortic valve disease or LVOT obstruction. So again, look at this. What do you see? What is the most striking feature? Not Ahmad, somebody else. What is the most striking feature on those on this tracing simultaneous? Look in that systole and diastole. Anybody has an idea? Well, look in diastole, I'll help you here. What's, what's very striking in diastole? The dangerous triangle. Yes. You have the brachial artery pressure and the LV pressure meeting, even not even in end diastole, almost in mid diastole. This is massive AI. This is as massive, massive acute AI. It has to be acute. This is as bad of an AI and as decompensated as you'll ever see. So much so that the arterial pressure is almost becoming rectangular, is almost mimicking a ventricular pressure, which is very impressive. You have absolutely no dichrotic notch and you have a relatively widened pulse pressure. But this is the most important feature here. So we have mid diastolic diastasis between arterial and LV pressure. So this is massive acute AI. Another thing you see, you see again, you see some gradient LV brachial artery. But again, like I just explained, this, you know, it may be very mild uh, AS, mild AS, valve area two with the massive AI flow, with the massive flow crossing the valve, you do get a little bit of gradient as per Gorlin equation. Um, I want you to look now at that second tracing, which is even interesting. It's the same patient we're having LV LA pressure recording. Okay. So one thing you notice, the LA pressure is very high. It's driven by the massive AI um, and by that LV diastolic pressure that is massively increased and overwhelmed. But there is another feature. If you look in diastole, this is the LV pressure. This is LV pressure in diastole. And this is the LA pressure. This is the LV, this is the LA. What is very characteristic? There is something pathognomonic that you will only see in AI, something between the LV and the LA. This is so like a gradient. The closure of mitral valve and diastolic MR and maybe like Austin Flint murmur. Yes, excellent. So you see one thing hemodynamically and I'll go to the points you mentioned. The LV exceeds LA and diastolic pressure. So there are conditions where LVDP exceeds mean LA. In general, we say LVDP is equal approximately to mean LA pressure, most often. There are conditions where LA exceeds LVDP, like we describe big V wave, for example. There are conditions where LVDP exceeds LA pressure, mean LA, such as the uh, LV diastolic dysfunction. But you will never find LVDP exceeding LA diastolic pressure. 
When this happens, that reverse gradient between LVDP and end LA pressure is very suggestive of massive AI that closes prematurely the mitral valve. And then you get the reverse gradient LVLA and you get diastolic mitral regurgitation. Now, earlier in the process that massive AI creates a degree of early mitral functional mitral stenosis, it's not clear in this example, but you can get an early mitral stenosis with a gradient, not here, we don't have it here. That could create the Austin Flint murmur. And then you get premature closure of the mitral valve, which creates that diastolic MR, okay? Austin Flint will be here. This is here, the diastolic MR. All right. Uh, so Austin Flint murmur is, you know, um, is a little different than mitral stenosis murmur. It's kind of a true mitral stenosis. It tends to be in mid diastole for the most part. Duration is a little different than uh, true anatomic mitral stenosis. Now in this particular patient, I want to give you this. Let's go back to AI and AS. The gradient, let's say here is 30 millimeter of mercury between LV and the brachial artery, okay? And the cardiac output, I'm going to give you the forward net cardiac output on, th the, on thermodilution, the cardiac output is four liters per minute, okay? So the gradient is 30 and the cardiac output is, um, is four liters per minute. Can you calculate in this patient the valve area? Just practice it in your mind. I'm helping you here. Again, valve area is valve flow divided by square root of pressure gradient. Valve flow is not cardiac output, it's cardiac output divided by systolic time. Eventually, those two here approximate that, and eventually the valve area by Hackey simplification is cardiac output divided by square root of pressure gradient. So I'm giving you here, in this case, the cardiac output by thermodilution is four, and the pressure gradient is 30. Could you calculate the valve area here? Anybody can tell me? Is it four divided by square root of 30? That's kind of my question, which will end up being, uh, you know, less, less than one centimeter square. But is that the answer? Four divided by square root of 30? This is a common thing that will recur actually. You need to know that idea very well. Uh, I don't think it's the case. I think mm -hmm. we sh because we should use the like the the the, car the stroke volume from the mitral valve, not from the aortic valve, because of severe AI. Uh, that is true. Uh, well, of course, or, the is RV, or the or the right ventricular cardiac output. That's true. You are correct. This is how we do it by echo, but by cath, the idea. So why four is not correct? Uh, because four is only the forward volume, it doesn't have the AR volume. Exactly, that's the idea. That's exactly the idea. What you mentioned probably is not, you know, because the other thing, the RV and the mitral flow are the net cardiac output. They are like thermodilution cardiac output. And that's why they are incorrect. So the idea here, and I'll explain it, the four liter per minute that I mentioned is the net cardiac output. This is what's eventually going and crossing the tricuspid valve and what you're measuring by thermodilution. This is a net cardiac output. This is not what's crossing the aortic valve. What's crossing the aortic valve is the summation of forward cardiac output, net, cardiac, net forward, but also the flow that's regurgitating. It's, you get 150 stroke volume, and only 60 is forward and only 60 is factored in the thermodilution. The true output uh, crossing the valve is more than double the net cardiac output. So when you're using valve area, you should measure flow across the valve or if you're using cardiac output, you have to use the output crossing the valve, which by definition, as you know, by echo, the flow crossing a valve that has regurgitation is probably over double the flow, the, the net flow, okay? Or the, on other term, the regurgitant fraction is over 50%, which means the forward flow is, or, or the total flow is double the net flow. So if you want to make that math, 
you have to at least double four. Once it's severe AI, make it, you know, make it eight liter per minute. Again, it's not going to be accurate because you don't know for sure, but at least double it to get an idea. There are other modality in the cath lab to get stroke, vo uh, stroke volume. You can use end cardiac output. You can use LV gram and you can use a volumetric method in LV gram to measure stroke volume and cardiac output. Uh, but that has pitfalls as well. Just the idea, know it. It's the same when you have mixed MS, MR. Don't use thermodilution cardiac output to calculate mitral valve area. You have to at least double it to calculate valve area. Otherwise, you'll get a very small valve area. If you use four, the valve area will be very small, much smaller than the true valve area, which is at least double. You got me? Uh, so you will overestimate the severity of AS unnecessarily. So know that, I want you to know it, it's very important. Everybody understood it? All right. Yeah, China. Okay, good. So this is here, I'm giving you more illustrations of just summary tracings. So this is one tracing here. So this is LV brachial artery. Again, I hope everybody can see now, there is no AS here. And there is, interestingly, there is a diastasis. Again, the brachial artery touches the alvena and diastole. So again, suggestive, this tracing suggests severe massive AI. Also no dichrotic notch. So, and, and, and massive actually pulse pressure. This is probably chronic decompensated AI more than acute AI. The pulse pressure is significantly wide. So this is AI here. Now I'm switching gears here. This is LV and LA pressure, not aorta anymore. Again, systole diastole. Can anybody beside Ahmed tell me, this is not a difficult tracing. Can anybody tell me what's the diagnosis here? LV, LA, what's the diagnosis here? Nobody knows, it's an easy tracing. Well, one in the MR. Yes. How? Why did you say so? Yes, I think that just uh, like the V wave, the tall V wave. Yes, it's a massive V wave. This is torrential MR. So, one look in diastole. There is excellent touching of the LA and LV. There is absolutely no mitral stenosis. You always get that E wave here, which is the early diastolic gradient. That's normal, but and it can be exaggerated in MR absolutely no mitral stenosis. In systole, yes, you have a massive V wave. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a V wave. It's the shape of it is V wave. It's not arterial waveform. Slow up slope, sharp down slope, late peaking after the peak of the LV. So this is a V wave, big V wave, so big. It's almost 75 millimeter of mercury. We call it big when it's 10 millimeter higher than the mean. Uh, or when it's twice the mean, but this is here massive. So this is severe torrential mitral regurgitation, decompensated mitral regurgitation. This is a third tracing. This one I'm giving you on the right side, right ventricle and right atrial pressure. Anybody can tell me the diagnosis here? This is pathognomonic for one thing and one thing only. Let me pick on somebody. Um, let's see. Abdul, if you're hearing me, can you tell me what's the diagnosis here? Well, maybe, uh, let's see. All right, well, I'll tell you, how about Dusop? Can you tell me? All right, well, I will answer it myself. So anyway, it, so wait, mm -hmm, go is ahead. Is it constrictive physiology? Um, no, why do you say so? Wait, it looked like uh, the square root sign to me, but. Mm -hmm. Well, the square root is very non-specific though. I know this is not square root. Square root, by the way, will be a big dip followed by an immediate plateau in early diastole. Okay, that would be square root. But even if you had it, it's really not specific. Square root, you can see it in RV failure. 
Okay, you can see it in severe tricuspid regurgitation. It's not specific. I wouldn't use that to prove constrictive pericarditis. To prove constrictive, like we talked about in the past, you need LV, RV simultaneous tracing. So this is RV and another one, LV simultaneous tracing. Um, you can see in systole, the systolic uh, pressure pulse variation with the respiration, and you can look in diastole for end equalization of pressures. But this doesn't help you at all for that. This is RV, RA. Anybody else? It has, look at the RA waveform. I mean, what is characteristic of it? This is very unusual here. Look at that RA. I mean, look at it. Look at the V wave, how it should be. Even in severe MR, look how the V wave is. Look at that V wave. Look at the shape of the RA compared to the shape of the RV. It's the same shape, very unusual. This is the normal shape of an RA pressure. Okay, you get A and you get V. A, X, V, Y, interrupted by AC. The X is interrupted by AC. So the V peaks late after T wave. Here you have no dip between C and V. You practically have barely any X. And basically the V wave here, or what we call in this case C V wave, it's peaking throughout systole rather than the, and the end of systole. And it's giving a ventricular shape. Can anybody tell now what this is? It's basically not just big V wave, it's big V wave that's peaking throughout systole, creating what we call the CV wave. It's becoming fused with the C wave. Big TR? Yes, it's massive TR. This is pathognomonic for severe TR. It's the ventricularized RA pressure. It's one of my favorite tracings. I almost show it in every lecture. It's called ventricularized right atrial pressure. You can tell it by physical exam, and I can often tell it by physical exam. It's ventricularized jugular venous pressure. I've showed it in other lectures. In this case, the JVP pulsates like the pulse. It is simultaneous to the carotid, and it has one waveform. This is, when you see that on physical exam, you know the patient has severe TR, okay? So this is severe TR here. You get ventricularized waveform. This is severe MR, this is severe AI. On the left side, you don't get, even with severe MR, you don't get ventricularized waveform simply because the, on the left side, the early gradient, the early difference between LV and LA pressure in systole is very high. So it's hard to get that rectangular shape but you do get it on the right side. Switching gears here, this is another tracing. Uh, I will help you, I'll tell you what this is. This is LV and this is LA or wedge pressure. Can, and this is the uh, scale here. Can anybody tell me what the diagnosis is here? Not Ahmed. Let's say, uh, let's pick on somebody else here. Who has a microphone and can answer me? Let's see. Lakshmi. No, she doesn't have it. Oh, Vikram. Can you tell me Vikram? Yeah. Um... So uh, the the pressures don't equalize um, mm -hmm. at the end of diastole. Yes. And uh, they meet kind of they, they equalize kind of not at the kind of uh, mid mid systole. So uh, so this LVLA. Yes. So when you don't equalize an end diastole, you got it. What's the diagnosis? Oh, it's mitral stenosis. Exactly. Good job. So good job. It's mitral stenosis. Look, even when you have here severe MR, I mentioned mitral stenosis. You know, my when you have no mitral stenosis, you have the LA and LV absolutely touch in diastole, definitely by the end of diastole. Here, the LV and LA are not touching in the end of diastole. 
So there is an end diastolic gradient between LA and LV, which is lack of end diastolic diastasis between LA and LV. This is mitral stenosis. For those of you, I don't want you to be confused. I was talking earlier about aorta LV. I switched gear here. I'm talking about LA LV. And the lack of end diastolic diastasis between LA and LV, which should happen, the lack of it is suggestive of severe mitral stenosis. As long as the heart rate is reasonably controlled, less than 80, 85 beats per minute. So heart rate reasonably controlled, no diastasis, this is severe MS. Another thing, heart rate reasonably controlled, less than 80. And valve gradient, if you want to assess the mitral valve gradient, I usually use that mid area. It's about, look at the scale, it's about five to 10 millimeter of mercury. So over five with a reasonably controlled heart rate, this is also suggestive of severe mitral stenosis. So those are two interesting features, lack of diastasis and gradient over five. There is a third feature here. If somebody gets it, it will be, he will be a superstar. I, I again talked about it before. The third feature, very suggestive of mitral stenosis here. Maybe Ahmed, would you know that? So the, the feature suggestive of severe, uh, I, mean, I apologize, the third feature suggestive of severe MS is big LA A wave, but no LV A wave on a properly damped uh, tracing. So that discrepancy, big A wave on the LA, no a wave on the LV because you have mitral stenosis. So you don't get transmission of that LA A wave into the LV. You don't get transmission of the atrial contraction pressure into the LV. Okay, this is suggestive of severe MS. Everybody got that feature? Big LA A wave, no LV A wave. Um, all right, and this is kind of in MS, you don't get S4. You need to know that. Of course, that's still maybe a board question. You hear S4 on exam, that's not mitral stenosis. And that's kind of the explanation for it, okay? So this is the same patient. We did something to him, okay? It's still LVLA and we changed the scale now, okay? Look at the scale, 100, 60, 40. We did something to him. And this is the tracing now. What changed on this patient? Look at the LA tracing here and look at it here. So I'll be, I'll so say- This patient uh, has like a balloon velvuloplasty and now he has like a mitral regurgitation. Exactly, good answer. So he underwent balloon, mitral balloon valvuloplasty. And now what you notice, the V wave is almost 70 millimeter of mercury, whereas the V wave here was, you know, you know, 16, 17. So you get massive rise of the V wave, okay? You still have a degree of gradient in the acetyl, but this is massive MR after balloon valvuloplasty. Now, why do you have still a gradient in the acetyl? It's what I explained earlier with AI. Again. MR. No. No, you have, M yes, exactly, exactly. It's the idea of you have massive MR, so we have a lot of flow crossing the mitral valve, and that will exaggerate the mitral valve gradient. I think the MS here is a lot better. I think the valve area could have gone from one centimeter square to two centimeters square between those two tracing. The gradient hasn't changed much because you have more than two times the flow crossing that mitral valve. So the gradient is still exaggerated. You still have discrepancy between LA and LV, um, between LA and LV A wave and no end diastolic diastasis. You still have features of MS, except in this case, they are caused by the high MR flow as we explained by the Hackey equation. Higher flow leads to higher gradient and higher hemodynamics of stenosis, okay? All right, good. I'm going to move to another uh, topic here. I'm again, I'm switching around here. I want you to be confused, but I want you to be able to grasp tracings. I'm moving back now to LV aortic pressure recordings. And here I'm doing what we do all the time, pull back. But uh, so, Again, this is not mitral valve disease here. This is LV aorta. So we pulled back using an end hole GR4 catheter. This is what you got, LV aorta. 
Here we pulled back using a multi-hole pigtail catheter. And this is what we obtained, LV, LV, aorta. What's the diagnosis in this patient? Not Ahmed, someone else. What's the diagnosis? Is it, I'll make it simple. Is it aortic stenosis? It's a drop at the no. aorta or is it LV, LVOT obstruction? LVOT obstruction. Well, here's the thing. So be careful. The point I want to illustrate here, it is aortic stenosis. And the point I want to illustrate here is the caveat with a pigtail, uh, with a multi-hole catheter. Yeah, so I, I think that's what the issue is. I think with multi-hole, half of the things were, half of the holes were outside. Yes. The LV in the aorta. And... Okay. Correctly. I mean, I think you understood the point well. Yeah, yeah. But the point here, the conclusion should be that it's aortic stenosis. Because end hole, when you're doing pullback, and if you're not certain where the stenosis is, the end hole is much more reliable to localize the obstruction than the side hole. It's fine to use side hole. We do it all the time for pullback. But those are cases where we're not having doubts. Where's this patient's obstruction, LVOT or aorta? If you do have doubt, side hole is not the way to localize your obstruction. You have to do pullback with end hole. If you don't have doubts, then it's OK. Then you know this is not real. The idea here is this. When you have side hole, at some point, as you're pulling back, if you're pulling back slowly, you're in the LV initially. Then eventually, you're in the aorta. But in between, some of those multi-holes are spread between the LV and the aorta, so much so that you get a hybrid waveform. That hybrid waveform could be an LV that's a little damped like the aorta, and it can mimic LVOT obstruction when the truth is it's just a hybrid catheter halfway in. So if you don't want to localize an obstruction, use end hole. If you know where it is, it's okay to use side hole. It's definitely okay to use side hole during simultaneous tracings because when you're doing simultaneous tracings, this is deeply in. So we're getting good uh, measurements usually. This is the other way around and that will fit with what you said, Roy, here. Here we're doing LV aorta pullback with an end hole catheter. The, in this case, it is LVOT obstruction because with an end hole catheter, the drop is at the level of the LVOT. Now, if you do it with a side hole catheter, then you can, do, you can have the opposite caveat. With side hole catheter, the hybrid waveform looks fully like aorta and you miss the LVOT obstruction. So again, side hole catheter can make you confuse aortic stenosis with LVOT obstruction or LVOT obstruction with aortic stenosis on pullback. When you're doing deep simultaneous tracing, it doesn't matter really. Multi-hole is fine. It's just for pullback, it can create those false impressions. So I wanted to highlight that idea. I hope everybody understood it. So it's end hole for pullback, for localization of obstruction when there is doubt. I'm going to show you this other tracing here. I hope everybody recognizes that. Again, this is LV aortic pressure tracing. I hope everybody recognizes this common sign that they ask on board. I showed it last time. This is the, again, you have a PAC and post PAC. Can anybody say what's the sign here? You're getting... Yes, down. yes, I didn't hear you well, but I hope you are saying broken bro phenomena. That's what, yes. yes, so it's the broken bro phenomena. And again, after a PAC or a PVC, you get a drop in pulse pressure and accentuation, dramatic accentuation in gradient with a drop in pulse pressure. Also the interesting shape of the aorta, very characteristic, spike and dome. You can have something similar like we mentioned in severe AI, except this patient doesn't have AI. He has some obstruction between the LV and aorta with a spike and dome, a morphology of the aorta. This is HOCOM. Another feature is the broken bro phenomenon. This is another, this one is aortic tracing. So can you tell me here, 
This is pure aortic tracing, and you can have that on board. So this is somebody, he had a PVC, and you're looking at the aortic tracing. What's the diagnosis here? On the top one, don't look at B, A. Anybody can tell after a PVC what's happening? It's the same, it's like a broken bro phenomenon. Exactly, exactly. But I'm trying to illustrate it just so you know, you don't need LV pressure to see the broken bro phenomenon. You can do it on physical exam. On physical exam, you get a PVC and after a pause, you get a narrow pulse pressure. You know, the pulse weakens after a PVC, which is opposite to what you expect in almost all conditions. This is a broken bro phenomenon, okay? So narrowing of pulse pressure after a PVC. More interestingly, you don't just narrow pulse pressure. Again, you get a spike and dome morphology of the aortic pressure after a PVC. Very, very characteristic of Holcom. Simple tracing, you can get it. It, will, uh, it is very pathognomonic for Holcom, okay? Everybody understood it? Again, you can get it by exam. You get accentuation of gradient after a PVC, and you get narrowing of the pulse, weakened pulse after a PVC. Now, this is the same patient. We did something to him. And after a PVC, you get no broken bro anymore. No spike and dome and no narrowing of pulse pressure. This is after LV gram in the old days where we used high um, osmolality contrast. So it's a high preload, increase the preload, you have no gradient anymore. And you have no obstruction, no broken bro. This is another tracing here. Uh, I'm going through a lot of those. So this is LV aortic pressure tracing. I hope everybody recognizes what's the diagnosis here. Not Ahmed. Is this, I'll make it simple. Is this aortic stenosis or is this LVOT obstruction? Um, let's say Vikram. If you're still... Yep. Um, I think I, here's what I will tell you since uh, I'll, I'll answer it. So it's simple, look at the upstrokes. This is the LV, this is the aortic pressure. Look at, look at Hocom. The upstroke is very sharp in the LV and the aorta. And you have a spike and dome appearance of the aorta. Here, the aorta is very uh, sluggish compared to the LV upstroke. That's very suggestive of aortic stenosis. The opposite is in LVOT obstruction. The opposite happened. It's sharp aorta, then bending of the LV. This is here, slow aorta, late peaking aortic pressure. This is aortic stenosis. Another feature you see, you see here an anacrotic notch. Again, suggestive of aortic stenosis. No AI in this patient, clearly. And always you do pullback. And when we pull back, we want to prove that both tracing gets superimposed to prove that we were doing a right recording, proper recording. And you look for two things. You want the pressure systole to match and you want the damping to be almost the same. Here, that tracing is a little more damp than that, which can create some errors, but it's not a dramatic difference in damping. So we're okay then. That proves that pullback that what we did here is an okay recording, okay? This is severe AS. Now, Vikram, this is another one. So I'm showing a lot of tracing. I hope you review those and you quiz yourself. You pause it and you quiz yourself after every tracing. It's a lot of tracings. I do want you to review those. This is another tracing. Again, this is a brachial artery. Try to shift it backward to see. And what do you see here? Is this AS or LVOT obstruction? I'm pointing to you with a red arrow. What is this on the arterial tracing? Yeah, is it uh, similar to the spike and dome pattern? Just kind of... Um, no, uh, and that's why I'm showing it to confuse you, but this is a spike and dome. It's a sharp upstroke of the aorta then another pressure wave. This is not spike and dome. This is an anacrotic notch. You don't get the spike and dome. You get an initial big one 
followed a spike followed by a dome. You get a high one followed by a dome. This is only one peak with an anacrotic notch. This is aortic stenosis, okay? This is aortic stenosis with okay. a big, this is aortic stenosis. Uh, you know, the aorta peak a lot later than the LV, whereas again, with LVOT obstruction, the aorta and LV are parallel, okay? The aorta and LV upstrokes are parallel. This patient has another thing. He has a very interesting finding, which is in, again, don't forget diastole. So you have in systole anacrotic notch and what looks like AS, a huge gradient. You also have in diastole and diastolic approximation and diastasis almost of brachial artery and LV with an attenuation of the diacrotic notch. Big anacrotic notch, no diacrotic notch. So this is also severe aortic insufficiency. So it's severe aortic insufficiency and probably severe AS, the gradient is massive. And remember the gradient is attenuated when you use a brachial artery because it's AI and the brachial artery is exaggerated, amplified in the periphery. So this is a rare combination of probably definitely severe AI and probably severe AS. It's a rare combination. This is another example for you, Vikram. So compare this to that. This one, you have early peaking. Again, what's confusing you, I think, is the fact that we're using peripheral arteries. So you have to shift them back in your mind. Peripheral arteries are more delayed than the aorta. Shift them back to the left in your mind and analyze. This is here going upstroke parallel to the LV with a spike and dome. So it's parallel to the LV, then you get an obstruction and you get a late gradient. Unlike AS where the aorta peaks late and the gradient is midway. Here, the aorta peaks early and the gradient is late with a spike and dome. If anything here, you get almost what you call an anacrotic notch on the LV, not when, when the LV starts becoming obstructive or obstructed. So you almost get an anacrotic notch on the LV in Hocum. So this tracing is Hocum. Spike and dome, late peaking, dagger-shaped gradient, sharp upslope of the LV and the aorta. Late peaking LV, not late peaking aorta. Now this is the same patient. We did something to him. We have no obstruction anymore. We could have done a lot of things. We could have given him fluid, contrast. We could have increased um, Afterload, so increasing preload or increasing afterload, move the gradient in an opposite direction. Gradient declines when the afterload or preload increases. Gradient declines when you reduce contractility as well. This is another reason. It could have been that we asked the patient to take a deep breath. Deep breath increases afterload and that reduces the gradient. This is practically for the valve hemodynamics. I was hoping to get to some uh, um, arterial tracings, but does everybody understand that? I want you to go back and review those. I gave you on purpose a lot of tracings. I want you to be able to be able to improvise, look at a different tracing, not be stuck on one ideal tracing. Just look at a variety of tracings. Some of them are confusing and be able to grasp, okay? So I want to go over those quickly. I know some of you have to go. For those who can stay, I just want to go over this in a couple of minutes. This is unrelated to valve per se. This is arterial, aortic, and peripheral arterial tracings. And for those of you who can stay, this is an aortic pressure tracing. What is this aortic pressure tracing suggestive of? You should be able to tell, looking at this, what's the diagnosis? Again, this is not valve, this is a pure aortic tracing here. It's a different topic. Anybody can tell? That was AS. It could be, uh, you know, it could be AS. It's not suggestive of AS. I know. can see, I can see like uh, pulses alternance. Uh, it is not pulses alternance. I'll show you another case. What is most striking initially, and, and that could fit with AS, not in this case though, is a very narrow pulse pressure. It's the opposite of white pulse pressure that I showed, very narrow pulse pressure. I mean, 
look at the difference between systole and diastole. It's, you know, 25 millimeter of mercury. It's definitely less than 25% of the systolic pressure. Not just that, it's a very narrow pulse pressure, but it's a very narrow systolic waveform. Look at that waveform, aortic wave. Look how narrow. What does this suggest? Narrow pulse pressure, very narrow systolic pressure. This is very low stroke, stroke volume. volume. Very low stroke volume. That's what it tells you. Now, could it be AS? The morphology doesn't suggest it. I'll explain why. Because so this suggests very low stroke volume as in very severe advanced heart failure. Now, in diastole, you have this that is suggestive of heart failure. This is diastole here. And you have almost another waveform. In the aorta, you have what we call that dicrotic notch is massively amplified. This is what you call dicrotic pulse. So you have big diastolic um, dicrotic notch from, that results from the severe clamped vasoconstriction in the periphery, which leads to worsened, reduced compliance, uh, as well as an overshoot of the dicrotic notch, because it's the arterial constriction that causes, one of the causes of dicrotic notch is the arterial constriction. When this exaggerates, you get a pronounced dicrotic notch. Okay, oh, beside the reduced compliance when you're very constricted. So this is what you get, and this is what you call dicrotic pulse. So you have two peaks in systole and diastole. This is different from the spike and dome and the pulses bisferians, where you have two peaks in systole. This is systole and the pulse in diastole. So this is very severe heart failure. His PA sat was around 40% at rest. This is another tracing, and this is what Ahmed mentioned. This is not pulses alternance here because the, this is a pulses alternance. So this is a patient. It's like the prior one. You have also dicrotic pulse. You have big systolic wave, big diastolic wave with a narrow and really tiny pulse pressure. Narrow and narrow in both directions, narrow in height, narrow in width, aortic pressure. So very suggestive of severe heart failure. Also dicrotic pulse, very pronounced dicrotic notch. But you also have another feature here, pulses alternance, somehow more seen on the right side in this patient. You have the pulse alternate between two morphology, this and that, this, that. This, that, same in the aorta. This is not pulses paradoxes, this is pulses alternance. And as Ahmed said, this is very suggestive of severe heart failure as well. Again, this is a patient with very low PA sat. This is pulses paradoxes, it's different. Pulses paradoxes, you get shrinking of the pulse pressure with respiration, okay? Not every other beat. Here you get it every other beat. So you can feel it on pulse exam, every other beat is shrinking. With pulses paradoxes, you get progressive shrinking over several beats of the pulse, okay? So difference. Uh, interestingly, that's the confusing thing. In tamponade, which gives you pulses paradoxes, you can get electrical alternance on EKG, whereas you get pulses alternance in heart failure. So don't be confused. Electrical alternance is tamponade, but pulses alternance is heart failure. Uh, again, this is a summary of those, pulses alternance, pulses paradoxes, and low cardiac output with the pronounced dicrotic pulse. This is a summary of all the aortic uh, waveform morphology in the variety of diseases I mentioned. This is a normal contour. This is the anacrotic notch, severe AS. Compare this to the Hocom morphology, which is sharp upslope with a spike and dome. This is a slow upslope with an anacrotic notch. So compare AS with Hocom. Uh, I am also showing you AI with loss of dicrotic notch, AI with pulses bisferians, both in systole, dicrotic pulse, systole, diastole. And this is poor measurement and damp pressure. This is the last slide. I showed it a little early. This is just to, um, uh, just to review it again. This is the difference between the aorta and peripheral pressure. So all those tracing I'm showing you here, it's important that they are all aortic pressure tracings, okay? You can use, in a lot of those, you can find the same feature if you use peripheral tracing. 
but things will change if you're using instead of aortic if you're using brachial or radial artery just realize that things will change they may not change enough to change that morphology you may have the exact same morphology in the periphery but realize there will be some change for example in as you, it will be hard to have that anacrotic notch in the peripheral arteries, okay? Because you have lower compliance in the peripheral artery, so you get sharper upslope in the peripheral arteries. So just know the peripheral arteries, things may change. And this is how they change in a normal individual. Uh, in, this is the aortic pressure, and this is the, let's say, brachial artery. So you get in the periphery, it's more delayed, it's sharper because they are less compliant. They have more muscles. And I, I, along with that lower compliance, you get sharper upslope and a sharper downslope with a more pronounced dichrotic notch because one more pronounced constriction to lesser compliance. So you shoot up and down quickly. And this is what we see on a peripheral Doppler actually, what we call triphasic waveform. It corresponds to that pressure. Systole, early diastolic reversal, then early forward diastolic flow, okay? So this is how it is. And again, you can get slight variation. For example, the dichrotic pulse, out of all those, the one that gets messed up the most in the periphery is the dichrotic pulse. Simply because in the, like if I tell you this is radial artery, I wouldn't be so certain this is severe heart failure simply because in the brachial artery, you do get pronounced dichrotic notch. Of course, the alternance and the narrowing of the pulse pressure will still suggest severe heart failure here, but not so much the morphology anymore. Okay. Did everybody understand? I know I gave you a lot of things. Uh, this is the end. Uh, anybody has questions? I know I talked about a lot of things, but I'll be happy to stay 10, 15 minutes if you have questions. Anybody? I don't hear you. Thank no? you so much. I don't see any questions, but this was really good. Yeah, thank, was you. Amazing. thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. All right. All right. I think I don't see any questions. I will end the meeting to try it up. All right. Thank you. Thank you for attending. Bye. Thank you so much.